My name is Rebecca Griffin, and I teach in the Language and Literature Department here at Cape Cod Community College. And on behalf of the Creative Writing Club and the Language and Literature Department, I'd like to welcome you to our third installment of the Bigger Boat Visiting, Writing, Visiting Writers series at Four Seas. And I'd also like to welcome our guest tonight, Dr. Amy Brady, who's our featured reader. Uh, we, the organizers of Bigger Boat, Hope, to have, hope that you have enjoyed these monthly readings throughout our first full semester in a remote format at Four Cs. I'd like to thank Dean Kathy McCarran for being so supportive of this series all semester. And also thank you to my co-organizers, Professor Tom Schaefer and Professor Michael Fournier, as well as Vanna Trudeau and her staff for her help on the technical side. And thank you to everyone else who contributed their expertise or made a point to attend our readings this semester. You've all made Bigger Boat possible, thank you. So before we get started with Dr. Brady's reading, I'd like to introduce our opening act for this evening. Um, my creative writing class will read a brief one act play by 4C student Henry Ryan. Unfortunately, Henry is unable to join us this evening, but hopefully he can catch the recording of his play titled Trial by Kangaroos performed by his classmates later. As we read, I'll share a copy of the script of the play with the audience. Obviously over Zoom, we can't have a real set or interactions between characters, but this semester we've discovered something that our great grandparents understood well from listening to radio dramas. Voices alone can tell a great story. But I'll also share the script with you. As I've shared the, the script with you, you'll be able to follow along at home. So here's the script. And I'd like to start off by having the cast introduce themselves, starting with Professor Michael Fournier. Hi, I'm Professor, Professor Michael Fournier. I'll be the narrator tonight. And JP Britt is here, um, but he's recovering from a dental procedure. So I'm gonna be playing the bailiff in his place. I'm Emma Vickery and I'm gonna be playing Galileo. I'm Jovan Yonk and I'm gonna be playing Dave. I'm Matthew Tomlinson and I'll be playing Scopes. I'm Aaron Olding and I'm playing Dudge, D Judge Diogenes. I'm Russell Voice, I'll be playing Juror One. I'm Madison Kuklinski. I'll be playing Juror 3. Curtain up. The courtroom is empty except for everyone in it. Jurors 1 through 6 are sitting in their booth. Galileo and Dave sit in the defendant's chair. Galileo looks nervous and fidgety. Dave looks bored. Scopes sits in the prosecution booth reclining with his hands behind his head. Bailiff stands next to the empty judge's chair. Have we started yet? We were supposed to start half an hour ago. All rise for the honorable Di Judge uh, Diogenes. Judge Diogenes enters, looking like he just got out of bed. All in the court rise, scopes a few seconds late. Diogenes takes a seat and sighs, holding up his gavel. All right, sit down, all of you. All sit. Now, let me see here. We are here to, deter to determine if the defendant, Dave. Dave waves. Is guilty. Diogenes slams his gavel. Okay, let's hear some opening statements. Scopes stands up, stretching, and turns to the jury. Hey, everyone, I'm Scopes. I'm here to prove to you all that that guy is guilty as sin. Points to Dave. And if you listen to me, I'll make sure you come to that conclusion too. All right, I'm done. He sits back down. Galileo stands up, sweating. Uh, hello everyone. I'm, I'm Galileo and I'm here to prove that my client is innocent of all charges. I mean, I mean, look at him. He gestures to Dave, who waves again. He looks like a nice guy, right? There's no way he could have done it. Galileo sits back down abruptly. Well, you both suck at presentation. Defense, let's hear your first witness. Slams his gavel again. 
You know they don't use those anymore, right, Your Honor? What? Those little hammer things, gavels. Judges don't use those anymore. They haven't in, like, years. Slams gavel. Silence! We the court find you guilty. I'm not the one on trial, Your Honor. Oh, fine, then. You're unguilty, but I've got my eye on you. Turns to Galileo. Well, hurry up. We haven't got all day. Right. We, the defense, would like to call Dave to the stand. Dave shrugs and takes the stand. Okay, Dave, tell the audience who you are. I'm Dave. I mean, tell them what you do and why you're here. I was ordered here by court. I'm the one on trial. No, I mean... Sighs and face palms to bailiff. Weren't you supposed to swear that guy in? Shrugs. <laughs> well, it's too late now. To Galileo. Are you done yet? Yeah, no further questions. Would the prosecution like to cross-examine? Takes a hit from a joint. <clears throat> sure, why not? Nothing else to do. Approaches the witness stand, still holding the joint. Okay, dude, whatever your name is. Are you guilty? I plead the fifth. If you say so. Let's try a different question. Where were you on the night of the seventh? But it's the fifth. The 5th of May. I was talking about the 7th of February. With sudden intensity. Boom! Caught you right in a lie. The jury gasps in shock and horror. Objection! Overruled. Your Honor, I rest my case. You only do that at the end of the trial. Back to Blase. Okay then, no more questions. He returns to his seat, as does Dave. Galileo massages his temples. Any more witnesses? No, Your Honor. We couldn't afford any more. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Okay, prosecution. Call your first witness. All right. Takes another hit and points to the jury. You there. Come to the stand. Juror number three looks confused for a few moments as Scopes keeps pointing at them. Everyone else just looks at them expectantly before they resign and vault over the jury box and head to the witness stand. Diogenes smacks the bailiff with his gavel. Swear them in already, you dingus. The bailiff comes up and holds up a copy of Goodnight Moon. Scopes keeps getting high. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, Jesus. Puts their hand on the book. I do. Yes or no, sir, ma'am? Yes. Good. Leaves with the book and starts reading it as Scopes approaches the stand. Will you state your name for the court? Um, yes, I'm. Yes, fascinating. Do you remember when, like five minutes ago, I said that that guy was guilty? Yes. Back to frenzy mode. Aha! Irrefutable evidence. I rest my case again. Objection. I object to your objection. Galileo punches Scopes in the face and he falls to the floor, dropping his joint. The jury let out studio audience oohs and cheers as Galileo keeps punching Scopes until the bailiff comes and knocks Galileo out with goodnight moon. Let's call a recess. Curtain down for a few seconds. When it rises again, everyone is back in their seats. Galileo is unconscious and Scopes is rubbing his face. Well, I think it's about time for closing statements. Does the prosecution want to go first? Sure. Stands and faces the jury. Everyone, I would like to thank you all for your time. You've all been wonderful and I want to thank you again for your time. I hope I presented a clear case as to why that jackass is guilty. Points at Dave. Thanks again. And does the defense have a closing statement? Dave nudges Galileo, who is still unconscious. Your Honor, 
I would like to plead insanity. Very well. Has the jury reached a verdict? Stands. Your Honor, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of all charges. Cheers. Woohoo! Yeah? Well, you insulted my little hammer, so I say you're wrong. The defendant is innocent. Slams gavel. Yay! Thank you all for coming to witness the triumph of justice. Be sure to follow us on Twitter. Now, get out. All of you, out. Now. Lights go down. Lights go down and curtains fall as everyone begins leaving, except Galileo, who is still unconscious. Good. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> nice job. Nice acting, everybody. I think the only one who flubbed the line was me. <laughs> so from here, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amy Brady. Um, I first met Amy Brady when she was my assigned mentor uh, when we were both PhD students at the University of Massachusetts. She was a little bit ahead of me. Um, although she's younger than me, I would never stop seeing Amy as someone that I aspire to emulate. Amy at the time was working on her dissertation on the theater of the depression era's federal theater project. And during her time at UMass, she did like one of the coolest things I could imagine. And that was that she conducted archival research at the Library of Congress, um, which is, is just such a cool thing to have been able to do. And um, I, I've always found Amy to be this wonderful mixture of searing intellect and pose on one hand, as well as have, possessing a deep curiosity and an offbeat sense of humor. And I'm so glad to have known her during her time in Amherst. Since graduating from the University of Massachusetts, Amy has gone on to exert her influence on the world in a number of ways, uh, writing about climate change, the arts and culture. I most appreciate Amy's ability to make climate change, which can feel like a large overwhelming topic um, into something that's more personal. Amy is currently the deputy publisher of Guernica Magazine and the editor in chief of the Chicago Review of Books. Her column, Burning Worlds, which appears in the Chicago Review of Books, addresses contemporary fiction and climate change. Her writing has appeared in a host of publications, including The New Republic, The Village Voice, Slate, and many more. She is also the co-editor of House on Fire, an anth anthology of personal essays on climate change about to be published by Catapult. She currently joins us from her home near New York City. Welcome, Dr. Amy Brady. Thank you, Rebecca. Wow, what a um, a really moving introduction. Uh, that was so kind. Thank you, and it's so 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 good to see your face again. Um, can I also just say that that play was amazing? <laughs> uh, you guys couldn't hear me because we're all on mute, but I am dying laughing over here, and also thinking about the crisis of justice in this country. <laughs> so, well done um, to the playwright and to the actors. That was that was fantastic. Um, great. Well, I, I think uh, you wanted to hear me do a reading, correct? Um, I picked today to read you guys uh, an essay that I actually published a couple of years ago, a personal essay um, about hiking in Acadia, uh, and I'm currently revising it um, to be included in a new collection. And uh, I'm going to read that essay, but I have to say I'm having some second thoughts because that play, um, while being so thought provoking, was still very funny. And I think I'm about to bring the room down <laughs> quite a bit. This is, this is not a funny essay. Um, it has actually uh, made me tear up sometimes reading it. I, I am very glad to be fortified by that play before I begin. So, um, with, uh, without further ado, I suppose I'll jump right in. Um, the title of this essay is Learning to Grieve in Acadia in 10 parts. Part one, Maine has long been known for its cool summers, but in July, 2018, the state suffered a heat wave that was gripping the planet. The heat reached Acadia National Park the same week my husband and I decided to spend two days camping and hiking there. We had arrived with hopes of glimpsing the wildlife I'd read in books by writers long dead. Fanny Erkstorm's birds, Leon Leonwood Bean's enormous fish, Henry David Thoreau's uncivilized owls. 
These animals had converted in my childhood imagination and visited me in dreams. To see them now would be like meeting old friends. We hiked to an open circle in the forest's understory and unloaded our gear. Sweat pooled on our backs as we pitched the tent and rolled out our sleeping bags, which stuck to our clammy fingers. A few hundred feet from camp, we found a water pump and used it to fill our metal water bottles. By mid-afternoon, we had set out on a steep one and a half mile trail that led to the top of Beach Cliff, a towering edifice that looms over Echo Lake. The sun singed our skin, but around us flora and birch trees danced in a light breeze. As we climbed, I listened for bird song. I knew from our guidebooks that Maine's forest birds stopped singing in late summer, but this was a peak migration period for shorebirds, and Acadia, which is a slip of land surrounded by ocean, fell directly in their path. Gulls and loons should have been filling the sky and dotting the shoreline, but I heard nothing. I squinted toward psalm sound in the distance, hoping to see the gulls resting there as tiny white specks, but saw only water. Where were the birds? The rodents for that matter. Hell, where were the bugs? Thinking back to my childhood, I suddenly remembered being terrified by loud noises. But here, with two hands on a boulder and my feet sinking into hot, dark peat, it was the profound silence that filled me with dread. Part two. On July 25th, 2018, the Portland Herald Press declared Earth's jet, jet stream broken, kinked, buckled, stuck. The ribbon of wind that circles the Earth was doing strange things, causing wildfires in the West, deadly heat spikes in the Middle East, and record high temperatures in Maine. Across the Atlantic, the heat wave grew to be Britain's longest in 42 years. At least 170 people around the globe would die from heat stroke. Statistics are harder to come by for non-human life, but Maine Public Radio reported that water temperatures in the Gulf of Maine reached historical highs that summer, stressing the bodies of land and sea creatures. Schools of fish floated, floated belly up in the Gulf. The forest's new growth wilted to a crispy brown. Neither had contributed to the CO2 in our atmosphere that broke the jet stream. Part three. Fanny Ekstorm was born to a fur trader in Brewster, Maine in 1865 and was a nature lover from a young age. In her 1901 guidebook on where to find Maine's most populous birds, she wrote, quote, the loon is the spirit of the lake, end quote. Observing the birds from a canoe on a lake in Maine's North Woods, she described a flock as, quote, a, a witch's carnival in broad day, end quote. The number of birds she witnessed would confound a birder today. Even when two miles away, she wrote, quote, you can see the loons filling the air like a snowstorm, rising, falling, hovering, settling, a cloud of white flakes, end quote. Their numbers were beyond casual computation. There could be 10,000, she wrote, or even 100,000. The mind, she continued, simply, quote, does not grasp the number. I remember as a child growing up in the landlocked state of Kansas that I would imagine such a flock as a cloud of wings, their calls sounding like laughter. Several decades later, I was struggling to grasp why the laughter was silent. Part four. An hour into the hike, the trail grew more vertical and less distinct from the rest of the forest floor. Vines and thick roots crossed the path, making it difficult to find our footing the air was dense with heat. I could feel it, feel it pulsing in rhythm with my heart. At the trail's halfway point, we paused to catch our breaths and drink from our water bottles. The trees were still quiet, so quiet that we could hear human voices traveling up the cliff from the lake below. Then suddenly a bird call. A single gull appeared overhead, its belly a white flame against the blue sky. It circled above as if watching us before disappearing from view. We waited for others to follow, but none came. Instead, more silence, more stillness. There would be no snowstorm of gulls that day. A wave of sadness, I felt a wave of sadness and wondered if it originated from the lone gull, a fleeting connection, an empathic exchange. We pressed on, but, this, but the sadness didn't dissipate. I thought of my childhood self, delighting in pictures of water birds and the sadness mushroomed into grief. Part five. 
According to the National Wildlife Federation, the five biggest threats to biodiversity are all human caused. Climate change, habitat loss, the introduction of invasive species, pollution, and overexploitation. How much loss of life is considered too much loss? Since 1977, herring gulls in Maine have experienced a 17% loss in population. Their numbers continue to decline annually by 2.3%, but the birds aren't listed as threatened or endangered by any government agency. To be endangered is, according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, simply to be, quote, in danger of extinction, end quote. Species are prioritized by the magnitude of the threat that they face, and the waiting list of candidates is long. There was a saying in Fanny Ekstrom's day, as thick as the gulls at Eastport. Today we say, we haven't lost enough. They don't yet require our protection. Part six. In 1960, Leon Leon Wood Bean, the same L.L. Bean who'd launched the successful outdoor clothing store, published my story, the autobiography of a down east merchant, a slim book teeming with photos of a boyhood spent in Maine's wilderness. Bean was 90 years old when he wrote it. In the preface, he writes that, quote, the great outdoors is a big help to keeping boys and girls out of trouble, end quote. He goes on to dedicate the book to the teenagers of America. It seems he believed that his childhood experiences would be possible to replicate for generations to come. In one photo, the author, wearing a bow tie and a white button down, smiles proudly at the camera while holding in each hand a pink salmon at least 18 inches long. They're beautiful specimens that were probably plentiful the summer he caught them. Historically, the Gulf of Maine produced 100,000 salmon adults per year. But since the late 1960s, those numbers have dwindled to 5,000 or fewer. In 2016, the Press Herald reported only 750 adult salmon in the area. Such a steep decline in so short a time is staggering, but L.L. Bean throwing in a fishing line wasn't the problem. The drivers of species loss are so systemic that no single person can be blamed. Likewise, no single person can stop them. Environmentalists talk often about how angry our grandchildren will be with us for what we've done to the planet. I'm angry now. Part seven. The sun was low by time we reached the peak of Beach Cliff and the air felt cooler. We found a flat rock on which to rest and think, the cool stone a relief against my sore and sunburnt body. We had time to spare before the sunset the hike up had taken two hours, but owing to gravity, the hike down would take 30 minutes. The coniferous below was a carpet of green, the distant lake a blistered sheet of grass. I gazed at the distant horizon and asked my husband, what does it mean to reach a peak? I already knew a few possible answers. The planet's use of coal may have already peaked. Sorry, I saw my internet was a little unstable. Okay. Um, what does it mean to reach a peak? I already knew a few possible answers. The planet's use of coal may have already peaked. Our rate of coal extraction may peak in the next 30 years. Our rate of oil extraction in the next five. Global warming will reach its thermal peak when we stop emitting carbon rich gases into the atmosphere. No one knows for sure how great the damage will be in the interim. A rustling in the grass stopped me from spiraling. The face of a chipmunk peered out and gave me a sidelong stare. But rather than empathy, empathy, this time I felt gratitude for the animal's life and the moment I could share it. We stared at each other a moment longer. If I had taken the chipmunk's photo, whether a viewer 50 years from now look at it the same way I look at photos of L.L. Bean's woman with nostalgic awe. Part eight. Most scientists agree that humans have fundamentally changed the way the planet works. 
That's why some have proposed in nature propose, proposes two start dates for this epoch. The first is the year 1610, the moment when human-driven exchanges, exchanges of species across our oceans began to accelerate. The second is 1964, when a large proportion of radioactive isotopes fallout from nuclear war testing could be found in rock layers. Whichever date we decide upon, one thing is certain. Humans are the first species to exert planet-wide influence, and now every living creature must live with the consequences. Part nine. In his posthumous work, The Maine Woods, Henry David Thoreau wrote, quote, generally speaking, the howling wilderness does not howl, end quote. For him, it scurried, whimpered, flew, flapped, Day and night, he was surrounded by a cacophony of sound, movement, and darting shadows. Such an abundance of life is hard to imagine today. It was even too riotous for Thoreau, who complained about the utterly, civil, utterly uncivilized big-throated owl who kept him from sleeping. His book doesn't specify the type of owl, but as a child, I determined, with the help of a school librarian, that it was probably of the great horned variety. I laughed when the librarian pointed out that when the owl saw Thoreau crashing through the forest, the annoyance was probably mutual. That's because few white people had ever traveled through those forests. And from Thoreau's point of view, despite his own presence there, this was for the best. He believed that those forests were not for human consumption, no matter how strongly we desire to make them ours. He goes on to link other observations about the woods to ethical truths. Today, those truths read like warnings, the first of many that would be issued by experts over the next century and a half. We have known for so long what we're doing to the earth. As early as 1896, Swedish scientist Savante Arrhenius published the first report on man-made global warming. Over the next 70 years, scientists would conduct a series of studies that suggested Antarctica's ice sheets were melting and might even collapse, raising sea levels worldwide. In 1988, NASA scientist James Hansen gave his influential testimony before Congress that global warming is real and human caused. It was a watershed moment, but still, few outside the scientific world seemed to take notice. By 2015, South Pole researchers confirmed that the West Antarctic ice sheet was indeed collapsing. That same year, nearly every nation on Earth pledged to sign the Paris Agreement. It was a moment of global optimism that didn't last long. Just two years later, President Donald Trump announced plans to withdraw the United States from the agreement. He made the announcement mere weeks after hurricanes Irma, Maria and Harvey created a series of human humanitarian crises that are still in effect today. How much loss is too much? Part 10. The horizon turned pink as the sun began to set. It was time to get moving. As we half climbed, half slid down the trail, my mind raced with visions of pain in the face of a very likely future, a future of unmitigated climate change, mass die-offs, and nearly unprecedented displacement of both human and non-human lives. We stopped so I could catch my breath, my heart pounding. I held tightly to a boulder and watched pieces of gravel break loose and tumble to the forest floor. I Thought of the gull, the chipmunk, the human waiting patiently beside me, and then feeling as my heart might burst, I shouted, I love you. It came from a place of sorrow and grief, but it also came from a place of hope. For perhaps if I shouted, I love you into the wind, I wouldn't have to cry, I miss you into emptiness. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brady. That was so moving. Uh, the end kind of caught me. <laughs>
Uh, all right, so before we begin the question and answer portion, I'd wanna thank everybody once again for coming to remind, uh, for coming and to remind you to stay tuned for uh, bigger boat readings and uh, for next semester that you're going to be uh, expecting a schedule, you can expect the schedule to be released pretty soon. Um, now we're going to begin our question and answer session with Dr. Brady and if you could please ask your questions in the chat window and I'll pass them along uh, to her. Um, and the first question that we've started a tradition already is that we've, we've been asking uh, our readers, how has the pandemic affected your writing life? And I've also been told to just please select uh, my name as you direct your questions to, to uh, Dr. Brady uh, in the chat. Okay, so um, how the pandemic has affected my writing life? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, as somebody who writes a lot about um, the great outdoors, I have uh, been forced to take a deep interest in ants on my windowsill <laughs> and uh, slugs in the garden. <laughs> Um, and along with the cats, a deep interest in the raccoons in our garbage, <laughs> um, which I joke about, but, you know, I, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever spent so much time in one spot. Um, you know, I, I am in the four walls of this small New York apartment every single day. I write here, I work here, I live here, I eat here. And um, it has really kind of forced me to notice things that I've never, uh, would never have given the time to noticing in the past. And things like, you know, noticing my cat's daily schedule. I mean, now that it's winter, they don't do much. They didn't do much anyway, but um, but they, they have a schedule. I mean, these are domestic creatures that can do anything they want, that they're spoiled rotten, but they, they have an actual schedule. They're up at the same time, they eat at the same time, um, they go to the bathroom at the same time, <laughs> almost every single day, they sleep at the same time. And that's fascinating to me to see these whole other worlds and ways of being and living um, that I have coexisted with for years and have never really noticed before. So um, so in a way, I, I, I appreciate that the pandemic has given me the time and the space to, to notice these other things that I've been oblivious to. Thank you. Uh, well, the first audience member question comes from Professor Kerry Drowen, um, and he remarks that you've so skillfully uh, woven together action, history, nature, and facts. And he wants to know um, what gave you the idea for the essay? Was it, was it the hike itself? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the hike was a, a very emotional one for me at the time. Um, and I knew that I couldn't write about it right away. Um, I needed to let at least at least a few months go by before I could put it in writing. Um, and I, I guess what I, I wanted to be able to communicate was that the reason why I was so upset during the hike was not because, oh, poor me, I didn't get to see birds. It's because I'd spent in a childhood reading about this very special, beautiful place that I had always thought was going to be filled with these incredible, these incredible little, you know, furry and fluttery lives. And, um, and they should have been there. And then to go and to not see them there was, um, was very hard and I knew that I needed somehow to express that this this wasn't just disappointment in the moment that this was something larger this was a change that had taken place over a longer period of time um, that the place that I was visiting in 2018 was not the place that Fanny Erkstorm visited in 1901 and it wasn't the place that um, you know that L.L. Bean visited and I thought the best way to capture that was to quote them directly and to show what that space looked like, you know, using their words versus what it looked like using mine. And from there, it just started to take a, a logical structure. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Professor Tom Schaefer. Um, and he asks, does Dr. Brady see her life as a writer severely um, if it has severely helped, hurt, or somewhere in between uh, because of her positions in editing and publishing? Um. 
Oh, um, has it hurt those things because I also write? I think that the question is how has the editing and publishing affected your life as a writer? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's really a reciprocal relationship in a lot of ways, you know, being an editor, um, has helped me enormously as a writer. That's one reason why I was so, um, excited to be able to revise this darn thing. Um, you know, uh, you know, every time I edit something, I learn something about, about writing, um, and being a writer in turn helps me to be a better editor. Um, because I know what it's like to create something and to put it on the page and to have somebody else read it. And um, that the responsibility lies with me to be able to put the picture that's in my head in somebody else's head. And that sometimes you need the person who has that other head to kind of help you do it because that transmission is invisible. Um, so yeah, um, it's, a, it's kind of a, a give and take that you know, those roles influence each other. I have a follow-up because I worked as an editor and I was a poet off <laughs> when I wasn't working as an editor. Does it take a lot out of you, so much out of you in terms of using words and language all day that it, it makes it harder to um, write creatively in your spare time? Or does it, do you feel like it's always this positive reciprocal relationship? You know, um, when I have a, an idea and I'm, I'm excited about writing about something, um, I, I find that, that writing in other areas of my life actually gives me more energy. You know, it's kind of like the old adage about working out, which for the record, I hate, <laughs> but I do run because I know if I go for a run, you know, at least a few times a week, then I actually have more energy to keep doing all the things that I want to do. And I think that's true with writing, even if I'm not working on a creative project and doing something, you know, something else in some other aspect of my life or editing, there's something about expending that energy actually gives me energy, um, especially when I'm excited about a project. If I don't have a project that I'm excited about, at the end of the day, after writing and editing other people's work, um, just, just give me some Netflix. <laughs> And I'll wait for, for inspiration to strike. Good. The next question is um, from one of my students, uh, Thomas Schultz. And I'm so glad to see you here, Tom. Um, how, long ha how long have you been writing? Oh, my gosh. Well, I think I wrote my first short story when I was about six years old. Um, my mother published it for me. Uh, she stapled it into a folder and uh, let me draw a, a cover. And I felt very fancy. Um, and that was great. Um, and then in college, I published a few personal essays, but I didn't really start taking it seriously until maybe eight, 10 years ago. And by serious, I mean publishing things that I might ultimately get paid for. Um, and, you know, I started, I kind of worked my way into some of those publications by publishing not essays, but criticism, which in and of itself was, um, a really informative experience because I got to know more about the publishing landscape. But also, I, you know, as I said to some of your students earlier today, learning to become a good critic makes you a better writer because it forces you to really zero in on what it is that you think makes a good piece of writing work. Um, and it's not always the same, it's rarely the same thing from one piece to the next. So being able to identify that and articulate it in a way, um, it is kind of like adding to your tool belt. Hmm. Great. Um, I have a, a question from Dean Kathy McCarran. Um, can you tell us about some exciting writers that you've discovered in your role as editor of the Chicago Review of Books? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so um, I will have to say that um, Professor Fortier is an incredible writer. <laughs> didn't discover him it's already long been discovered but he's incredible um but we have a a, a regular contributor her name is Shazia Langford um and Shazia is somebody who I am always excited to see either pitching us or um sometimes you know we go after her to say hey will you will you uh, write about x y or z for us um she's such a thoughtful observer of the world around us. And when she writes criticism, she is like a, like a blade 
kind of, you know, slicing a text and saying like this is working because of this very narrow little thing here, which is very different than this little slice over here. She's a very, very sharp person. And I always thought she's really going to go far. She's a Canadian writer, I should say. She's really going to go far. And then the other day, uh, in my role as the editor in chief of the Chicago Review of Books, I, I had a publicist of an anthology, a Canadian anthology, reach out to me. It's a, a new book of um, of essays about climate change, and so do you? Will you take a look at this and consider it for coverage? And I said yes, absolutely. And so the very first thing I ever do with any anthologies, I just turn to the table of contents to see who's contributing, and I saw Shazia's name. I had no idea. She was interested in climate change, um, you know, let alone writing personal essays about it. And hers was the first one I read. And it's absolutely brilliant, just like I knew it would be. And um, it's one of the, her first kind of full length, fully fledged essays to get published. And it landed in this anthology. And I very excited and proud for her. And then also very excited and proud for me because I got to say, oh, I, I discovered her. I discovered that writer. <laughs> um, sp speaking of um, some of the contacts that you've been able to make uh, as an editor, uh, Professor Michael Fournier asked a question. Uh, he's, he mentioned that you've been holding climate change uh, talks with big authors in New York City. Uh, and, and what has the, pr that process been like? Oh, um, well, it's it's fantastic. Uh, and I hope that post COVID, we can start holding them in person again. I've done a couple over Zoom and um, and just like this, it's, it's wonderful. I'm so glad we can make it happen. But, you know, as the many theater people on this call know, there's nothing like being in the same room <laughs> physically with somebody else. So I hope we get back to it soon. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, I, um, you might specifically be talking about the art and activism in the Anthropocene series that um, I did with Guernica and the New York Society Library uh, about a year and a half ago, two years now maybe. And it attracted some uh, really big names. Um, Jeff Vandermeer, who is now really known for the movie Annihilation that came out um, a few years ago, is based on one of his books. Um, William T. Bullman, um, the incredible journalist, uh, David Wallace Wells, who wrote The Un Uninhabitable Earth, who was very influential for me. Um, Helen Phillips, Amitav Ghosh, um, all kinds of people. And what was so great about getting them in the same room is that we have all of these people who are thinking about this larger global problem um, who are also creative people and are finding their own unique ways to give this large unwieldy problem a narrative shape. And we got to talk about it, you know, uh, uh, amongst each other and then with the, with the audience, um, you know, about why that's important. And, um, you know, since then, I've, I've kept in touch, you know, with some of those folks. Um, I consider to this day Jeff to actually be a pretty good friend. I, I hope I get to visit him in his new place in Florida someday. But I think he and his wife, Anne, are even more socially isolated than we are at this point, And we never leave. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Um, and I, I have to say that you know, as, as much as I value those relationships on a professional level, um, as well as a personal level, it also just feels like supporting them and giving them a platform is also just being a good literary citizen. Um, because no matter how famous you get, it's hard to get your words out there. And, um, you know, if there's one thing I hope anybody who comes and hears me talk takes away is just support each other. Um, because writers got to have each other's backs because it is tough out there. Thank you. Um, next question comes uh, from Professor William Berry. Um, do you have any thoughts on psychogeography and writing about and and writing and global warming? Psychogeography. Um, I think I would need to know a little bit more about how the professor's defining that term. Um, it, it brings to my mind um, everything from experiencing trauma in a geography to the land itself having a kind of memory, but those two feel like very different things. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, would, would that person like to expand a little bit? I mean, I hate to be that person, but I don't want to give a long-winded answer that makes no sense. <laughs> 
Um, I was, I apologize for being, um, if I were vague, but, you know, I think of psychogeography of, you know, the sort of waddling around landscapes um, and viewing landscapes. Um, and I was reminded of that in your own essay. Um, and I heard, you know, a lot of, uh, of, of sort of looking at the landscape, contemplating global warming and writing about it. Um, and I was just kind of curious to hear you talk a little bit more about that process of being in a space, exploring it, um, feeling it, you know, mm -hmm. does that help? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, that, that's very helpful. Um, well, it actually makes me think of something that happened for why I was inspired to put together House on Fire, which is my anthology that's coming out in early 2022. It's, um, it's actually going to include the, a version of the essay that I just read. Um, I think it still needs some revision, uh, as well as several essays by uh, many, many other writers. What inspired the collection is that um, as the trivia question uh, reminded everybody, I'm originally from Kansas. Uh, I grew up there. Um, I remember summer nights in Kansas being very, very loud. Um, crickets, locusts, frogs. Um, my family and I, we would often sit outside around a bonfire and we would have to shout at each other to be heard over you know, the riveting and you know, the cacophony of you know, the space. Um, a year ago, <clears throat> uh, the summer before the summer, um, I was visiting home again. Uh, it was another heat wave had hit the Midwest. And I went outside to sit at the house that my dad still lives at, uh, where we used to have those bonfires. And it was silent absolutely silent and there was something about the disappearance of that that sound made the land feel very eerie and unfamiliar uncanny is a word that um, I would apply to it and here's a land that I know as well as the back of my own hand right it's very familiar to me that suddenly felt very very unfamiliar and so I find that climate change is kind of doing something maybe not to our, mem our specific memories, but our relationship to those memories and to the childhood spaces that we know so, so well. Um, it, it felt weird to feel like that space was, had become a stranger to me. I, you know, I always thought that backyard was my best friend and now it was a stranger. Um, I don't know, I don't know, that's not really a direct answer, but, um, yeah, great, great. I mean, like I said, it. what, what that, I will say this too, what that experience did for me is that it also made me realize how little writing there is about climate change as it exists at the level of a life, right? We're always talking about climate change in these large, you know, uh, these, these large um, concepts in terms of community, which is important, in terms of the planet, which is important, but not how it changes our personal relationships to things like our backyard. And that's what I hope this anthology is going to do. You know, I asked writers, write about that. Write about those very personal things that you're going through as a result of these larger changes to the planet. One of the things that you mentioned this afternoon in the creative writing class was how um, cliche it's gotten to have uh, stories be post-apocalyptic climate yeah. change stories and how um, important it is to, to show how climate change affects people on a personal level. I thought that was so interesting. Um, actually, I have a, a question that's related to that. And I, I think this is the last question of the evening. Um, and that is, uh, I wanted how, to know how you can keep returning to such a distressing topic. Um, I, I think, it's something that we're kind of wrapped up with, with guilt. Like we all talked about in the class this afternoon that in, like as individuals, it's very hard to make a big difference. We find ourselves um, maybe like you said, buying a bottle of bottled water and then wanting to kind of forget about climate change for a little bit. Um, yeah. And you've written, you've said that there's nothing like the specter of mass annihilation to bring out our capacity for connection and kindness. And it was just, it's a little different than you might think. I wondered if you actually believe that. Yeah, yeah, in short, yes. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I will say, I will say that climate change, of course, is a very um, difficult topic to write about because um, it's scary and um, it is guilt inducing. So I'm getting over that and I would encourage other people to do that too, because we are not all equal actors in the villainy of climate change by any means. Um, and uh, it's also despairing because so much has already been lost. That is an undisputable fact and much more will be lost, um, which is a fact that gets disputed, but a fact nonetheless. <laughs> and so it's, it's very difficult. But the thing is, is that there are a lot of people I mean, we can talk about animals and plants and insects as well, but we need to talk about people because climate change is not just an environmental crisis, it's a humanitarian one. And there are a lot of people whose lives and livelihoods are far more threatened than mine. I mean, sure, New York City is threatened by sea level rise, but New York City is also the, you know, the, the capitalism's epicenter in this world. Um, it, we're going to build a seawall to protect it if we have to, <laughs> right? Um, the people who live on the Marshall Islands, they don't have that option. Um, it is, scientists say that it could be not within a hundred years, which is what most climate models go out to, but within the next 20, that they could be losing their entire history and culture because their islands are going to be submerged by the sea. The people who live in Bengal, and in Bangladesh, um, they scientists predict a devastating heat wave that could, you know, essentially kill a third of their population, and they're also threatened by sea level rise. I mean, there are people, human beings, who are in dire need of the rest of us um, to, uh, to to take this situation seriously, and so I try to remember that when I keep coming back to climate change, that it's not, yeah, it's hard, but it's also a moral responsibility. Um, it would be very easy for me to just watch Netflix every night. And trust me, I watch Netflix a lot, especially now. But um, the people, you know, again, on the Marshall Islands don't have that option. Um, and so I feel like if, yeah, I'm a single person, but you know, I'm a single person that can help inspire a movement and more people to keep talking about it and thinking about it and feeling it at an individual level instead of just thinking about it in terms of you know planetary you know forces. Um, and that helps me to keep going. And I think that's what anybody who's in climate activism or climate writing, which I do think is a form of activism, you know, would say is that we don't have the luxury or rather we have the luxury, but others don't. And so at least on their behalf, let's, let's keep returning to it, even if it's hard. Good. I, I'm sorry. I have one more related question. It comes from student Matthew Tomlinson. And I, I think it's, it's related enough that it, it, uh, it's a good follow-up. So uh, how do you counter the popularity of escapism, which is largely optimistic, whereas climate change makes people look at a real issue in, the, in its face? Yeah, well, I will say that, um, especially in the realm of, uh, of novels and short stories, um, there are a lot of people who are writing about climate change um, who are turning away from uh, escapism and you know, the apocalyptic and starting to kind of embrace a more hopeful and courageous narrative. Um, you know, one of my favorite books to come out this year, it's one that I mentioned earlier in your class, Becca, is by Kim Stanley Robinson. It's called The Ministry for the Future. And it's a work of science fiction that's set in the very near future within the next five to 10 years that shows that, uh, that depicts a world in which we actually have globally worked collect as a collective to bring about a more just and sustainable future that works for everybody. But that the years between now and there were really hard and it took a lot of different people doing a lot of different things, but ultimately collective action to make it happen. Um, and in a way it's, it's kind of a model 
you know, a model for, for how to be and to move forward. And I'm so glad that this book is getting a lot of attention. I, I read a review of it in the New York Times and the New York Book Review um, in places that, you know, people still read, <laughs> which is great. It's on best of book lists. And, um, you know, I think that's the way to do it is if, if wanting to escape all of this is human nature, then write about stories that actually inspire instead of, you know, depress. Um, sure, anything about climate change is going to be depressing to an extent, but show people a way out. Um, and people like, you know, Robinson are doing that. Great. Well, thank you. It's nice to end on a hopeful note and seeing what the um, what climate change fiction can bring us in terms of a model for the future. And I'd like to thank you, Amy, so much for coming tonight and for coming to my class. This has just really enriched um, our experience and our discussion on campus. I'm sure that we're gonna it's gonna fuel many discussions for us uh, in the weeks to come. So thank you so much. Uh, and thank you again to everybody uh, who came out tonight. This is our final Bigger Boat Visiting Writing Series uh, event of the semester. So good night and smooth sailing. Thank you. <laughs>